Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to um, the uh, Astronomical Society of Edinburgh's Introduction to Astro Imaging Part 2. Um, for those unfortunate uh, souls who missed part one, it's available on the website uh, and you can catch it all, catch it there and indeed details of our four <coughs> steps program. Um, tonight is really about stacking and uh, EAA. Um, we'll be covering that uh, in a reasonable amount of detail um, with a couple of live demos. So what could possibly go wrong? Hmm. Anyway, change the slide, please, Matt. So stacking, Mark will cover um, uh, stacking and indeed wide angle tracked and stacked imaging. And then I'll talk about uh, EAA, uh, which is my passion. Um, and whilst I'll focus on some software and the camera I use, we'll talk about the other equipment that's available and what it can do. And uh, I think with that, I'll hand it over to you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, so the first um, session we had was last week on simple imaging, single shot, short exposures. Um, this is quite a bit different this time. Um, we're talking about, just give me a second, let people in. Uh, we're talking about multiple shots. Why do we do stacking? What's the point of it? Um, we're talking about stacking now because all the imaging we're going to discuss in the next next few parts today and the next two parts after this will have some form of stacking in it. So we'll cover it in a bit of detail just to make sure we know what we're on about. Um, if I do know what I'm on about, but we'll find <laughs> that out. So what, what is stacking? Um, a single shot um, can be pretty noisy. You stack several images together, it becomes much smoother. So let's sh show you what I mean by that. Click on the right screen. So here's a, a single shot of a quadrant of the Rosette Nebula. Um, hopefully you can see the detail in that. Um, you can see quite a lot of nebulosity, but also quite a lot of noise in there. Lots of speckled points of light as well. Uh, it's not too bad, but it could be better. If we were to stack 10 of those together, you can instantly see the difference. 10 frames makes it much smoother, gets rid of a lot of the noise. Um, a lot more contrast. There's still room for improvement on that. I think if we stacked another 10 frames, it will be even better. Can you can you tell the difference um, from the shared screen there? Is it coming over in enough detail? Nod your heads if you can see it. <laughs> yes, good. Thank you. Yeah, if I do uh, zoom in a bit closer, um, you can see the noise in a bit more detail there. And the, the smoother stacked one has a lot more contrast as well. Admit more people. Okay. So what is stacking? Well, basically what we're trying to do with stacking is to increase the signal to noise ratio. So we want, want a lot of signal and um, very little noise. Um, so the object is in every frame, but the noise is random in every frame. So as you stack the object, stack the frames, the object increases in brightness and density, but the noise averages out over several frames. So the more frames that you stack, the better the signal to noise ratio, but only up to a point. I'll touch on that a bit later on. Um, maybe 10, 20, 30 frames, but after that, things start to get a little, little less obvious. But two to five frames even make a noticeable difference. So put two frames together from the first one, you'll see a difference straight away. What we're trying to do with, with stacking is to get the noise to as low level as possible. So I think if you need, you want to be serious about astro imaging, you need to get your head around what noise actually is because it affects everything that you do in imaging, how many you stack, um, what sort of equipment you buy, what sort of image processing you do, what you've got at the end. Of, your, of the process. Uh, there are various sources of noise, the random shot noise, that's the stuff that comes from the universe in general that you have in every every image, the stuff that we've just seen really, on those two images. And to get rid of that, you would stack multiple frames to 
reduce the shock noise. You're never going to totally get rid of it. For thermal dark current noises, um, if you have a DSLR, for example, your the sensor in your DSLR might actually be uh, quite a bit warmer than, than the ambient temperature around about you. That can produce um, noise as well. Um, if you have a dedicated astro camera, you can quite often chill it. So I can chill mine to about 25 degrees below ambient temperature. So I often um, shoot my images at about minus 15 degrees C. And that seems to get rid of just about all of that. But most, most cameras have some form of thermal noise. Um, some cameras will go really low. Uh, some professional cameras have liquid nitrogen and things like that to cool them really, really low. Read noise, this is quite interesting and um, leads into some of the things where Andrew is going to be discussing later on. Um, every time you read a frame from the sensor of your camera, you add noise. So if you have very little signal on that frame, it might get lost in the noise. In fact, the actual read noise might be as much, if not more than the actual signal itself and therefore it can be, can be lost. So really short exposures, um, can get lost in, in read noise. Um, so if you're doing many, many exposures, short exposures, and each one has the read noise, then you might end up with no signal at the end of that at all, or very little signal. And fixed sensor noise. Um, even when a sensor is not exposed to any light, there are actually, there's actually data in there. So you need to know what that is before you take your first image so you can subtract it. Each pixel in the, in the sensor behaves differently. Um, you might get some noise from an amplifier or a piece of electronics next to the sensor or something like that. They, they can all be removed with bias frames, darks and flats. Now we'll discuss what those are in a future session, uh, probably session four, about calibrating your, your, your signals, your, your light frames using these um, bias darks and flats, but we'll not touch that just now. What is noise? Um, how do you choose your exposures based on what noise actually is. Do you use a few long exposures or many short exposures? Here's a, a graph that um, you could argue is wrong, but at a basic level, it is actually right. So along the bottom, say those are the number of frames you stack. The blue line as you stack it goes up linearly. So that's your signal, that's the image um, increasing. Um, the noise after a couple of frames starts to level out um, and it will eventually sort of plateau. So that's why after a certain number of frames that you stack, you're gonna get limited uh, difference in your signal to noise ratio. Um, I could have done this much longer and you'll see it flattening. It never quite flattens out totally, but it gets much less. So your, your signal very quickly um, outstrips the noise, um, the more frames that you stack. The other problem, of course, is light pollution. Um, if you um, expose for 10 minutes anywhere around here, you're going to get that, um, or worse than that, in fact. The problem is light pollution doesn't actually look like that. It's rarely that uniform over the whole thing. So just subtracting um, a flat level from your uh, image will not give you no light pollution, because light pollution often comes in gradients and comes at different sides of the image more than others, and it can look really quite messy. Um, we will discuss light pollution probably in part four as well. So um, is a thousand one second exposures the same as one one thousand ex second exposure? No, not really. Yes and no, you'll gather the same number of photons, but you won't get the same result. Um, your one thousand one second exposures quite likely will get lost in the read noise. You'll then end up with no signal and no dynamic range. You might get white or black, but no shades of gray in between. Um, so very short exposures can get lost in the read noise. Um, an exposure for something bright like Orion Nebula or the Andromeda Galaxy will need to be much less than a faint galaxy. As an example, <coughs> there's a picture of M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, I did recently. That was four minutes exposures. I think it is. I can't see that because I've lost my um panel and the forward exposures um still a bit of noise in that and it could be more images stacked there to get rid of it but it's pretty good um but the orion nebula only really required one minute exposures and it's pretty smooth pretty bright and quite a, a good dynamic range there
anecdotally, people seem to think CCDs work better with a few longer exposures and CMOS cameras work better with um, a few shorter exposures, a, a lot of shorter exposures. Um, with CMOS cameras, you've also got the concept of gain, which is like ISO in your DSLR. Um, you'll get a nice brighter image, but you will also lose dynamic range. You'll compress the signal and that gives you fewer shades of gray. So um, people ask quite regularly, what should the exposure be? The answer is, I don't know. Um, and no one really does because there are loads of uh, reasons that will, uh, loads of factors that affect that um, exposure level, what the object is, what your local sky conditions are, what the current sky conditions are, what camera you've chosen, what the sensor is on that camera, your telescope, the focal length, the F ratio, how good is your mount? Is it Altars? Is it, is it equatorial? Are you using filters, narrow band, color filters? Um, are you just tracking? Or are you auto guiding? How long can you go? Uh, what the temperature is outside? And it could go on. There's other, other um, things that will feed into that as well. So um, no, can't give you a straightforward answer. Uh, on our Flickr group, I often encourage the imaging group members to put the details of their equipment, what they shot, what the exposures were, and the processing so that we can all learn from that. And it's a sort of a, a mark in the ground, stake in the ground that this image works well with these sorts of settings or not. In many cases, I, I have often found that I've chosen exposure settings that were totally wrong and I've recorded that somewhere. If you lose that information, then you make the same mistakes again sometime in the future. So remember that. Okay, that's that's the theory <laughs> over with for now. Um, we were talking about single shot wide angle um, images last week. Um, stick your camera on a tripod and take a short exposure. This time we're doing tracked wide, ang wide angle imaging. So we've got a tracking camera mount. There's a, a few examples. You can see the one I use over my shoulder here. This is the uh, Skywatcher one. Um, you put your DSLR on it. Um, you can have exposures of one to five minutes and it doesn't trail depending on the focal length you've chosen. Um, you will need to do trial and error what focal length works with your camera lens and with your tracking mount and it will depend on good polar alignment. Um, there are various options and they're relatively cheap. I think 250 to 400 pounds for those three there. Um, that's, as I said, that's the one I use. There is a, a nice illuminated polar scope in there, so I can be polar aligned within five minutes very accurately. Um, I use this SynScan init app. It tells me where to put Polaris on the reticule. And um, as long as you've got a nice solid tripod, um, and it doesn't move within the exposures, it should work really well. And I've had uh, five minute exposures at, at 18 millimeters focal length without any trailing at all. Um, I've got mine on an old altazimuth mount, which has slow motions, which makes it very easy to accurately um, do the polar alignment. But as long as you've got a, a solid tripod, I think a standard photographic one probably won't do it. You need something a bit more meaty than, than your basic photographic one. You need something that will hold a few kilograms of weight. Okay, so some images taken with that setup. Um, this is not from Edinburgh, as I'm sure you can probably imagine. I don't get skies that dark that will allow three minute exposures, that wide angle. So that was an 18 millimeter focal length from France last year. Uh, and it's pretty good. And that was just one single frame. Put something else in. Um, if we stack it, we immediately get an increase in um, smoothness and in contrast and see a lot more detail. Uh, we've got Jupiter over there and Saturn down here and more subtly bits of the Milky Way that we often see from around here. So you can see instantaneously the, 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 the change that stacking has on wide angle images as well. And, and these were all uh, three minute exposures. I think that was 10 minute, three minute exposures and it, and it made quite a bit of difference. And of course you can take it a little bit further and you can animate your uh, wide angle night sky stuff. I'm not going to go into how to do this because uh, I'm not an expert in it and there are very good tutorials online about how to animate it, but um, it is quite a fun thing to do. Interesting thing is if you track the stars, the, the world actually turns, which is 
how it should be actually because it is the world that's turning and the stars are, are fixed but i when i actually did this i hadn't quite worked out what was going to happen until i actually processed it and it's, it's really quite nice um for wide angled uh, driven imaging what should you use um Something called Sequator is great if you've got a, a Windows PC. Um, it does all the things you could want it to do. And there's lots of tutorials online. If you're a Mac user, Starry Landscape Stacker, of course, it's Mac, so it's cost you money, $40. It's apparently slightly better than Sequator, but not much in it. Um, I don't have an answer for Linux host, I'm afraid. So maybe you can search one out for that. Uh, it'd be both stack image, reduce noise and light pollution, and they can stabilize the ground feature as well if you've got that in your shot. This is what Sequator looks like. It's really straightforward to, to use. You can see they've painted a mask on the ground here to stabilize that while they process the stars. Um, various simple options here, using light pollution, enhancing starlight and so on. But um, there are good tutorials online about that, and it's not my area of expertise. So I will leave it there for that one. Back to a bit of theory, um, the histogram. The reason I'm doing this now is because what Andrew's about to talk about relies quite strongly on the histogram as well, as does every bit of imaging we're going to do from now on also. Um, so what is it? How do you use it in imaging and EAA? It's about stretching the levels. I mentioned the word stretching before so you can see stuff, setting the black, gray and white points. So I'll try and illustrate what that actually means. So here's a picture of M81 I took a couple of weeks ago and here is the histogram. Um, to the left you've got the black point, the gray point there and the white point. Um, looks fine, looks straightforward, but that's not actually what it originally looked like. Once I'd processed all my frames and stacked them, this is what the histogram actually looked like. And all you can see are a few bright stars and maybe the core of the galaxy, but the histogram is pretty non-existent there. So you have to stretch the level so you can actually see it. And that's what I mean by stretching is, is, is pulling the histogram out. What that actually means is if you've got a 60, if you're working with 16 bit TIFF files and you've got this a nice um, Astro camera that gives you 16 bits and 65,000 levels of gray, after you're stretching it, you might be, uh, your nice expensive CCD camera might be displaying uh, data to the level of a very cheap webcam or something like that with just 256 levels or even less. And your computer screen and um, isn't great at displaying very level, very many levels either, and your eye can't detect them either. So um, stretching removes the dynamic range, but the idea is to get the dynamic range to the point where it looks acceptable on your screen for printing or for your eyes, whatever. But the more you stretch it, the smaller your dynamic range. So instead of 65,000 levels, you might have 256 levels, uh, but that's what you need to do. Um, and very short exposures will give you even less dynamic range too. Um, so I'm just going to do a very quick demo of uh, what stretching histogram actually looks like, if I can make this work. Um, stop the share there. So here's Photoshop. Um, with that same image of M81, it's um, pretty dark as you can see. If I bring up the levels tool, uh, it's hidden somewhere. There we go. And there's a, there's the histogram, very small. So if I move the gray point over to the left, you can see things are starting to come out. But it's also bringing up the sky background as well. So if I keep repeatedly doing this, I can see the black point is now well over to the left from the from the histogram. And so I'll now drag that over. Um, and both the background's gone down, but also the, the galaxy has as well. Um, in the imaging group, we have quite a lot of discussion about the black point, about where it should be, don't we, Mike? Um, <laughs> we can discuss that at another time. So let's bring it up a little bit further. And now you can see the galaxy starting to come out. I'll bring the black point over a little bit. And one last time, 
know, the histograms are beginning to look like we, we saw before. Uh, we don't bring the black point beyond the start of the histogram, otherwise you start losing data. You can see there that we're actually losing the fainter outer spiral arms. So we keep it just to the left. Um, Mike says it should be pitch black. I say it should be just slightly off black because I've never seen a pitch black sky from anywhere, actually. Um, the downside of using the levels this way is that you can actually blow out the core of the galaxy. And if we keep going, we can see the dust showing up as well. And you end up showing lots of noise. So quite often you can see spiral arms showing this horrible fuzzy appearance here. And that's because you've stretched it more than the data can take. So if you put it back to where it was before. I'm just going to show you briefly how you would use curves rather than levels. So here's the curves tool you'll get in most software of some form. Um, but the right hand side still is the brighter highlights are like the inner part of the galaxy and, and the left is the fainter stuff. So if I bring up the top bit here, we'll start to blow out the core of the galaxy. What I can do is add another point and bring the core back down but enhance the other bits. So when you do to your final uh, fine tuning of your, your image, that's a good way to good way to work. There you end up with a, an image that looks looks more reasonable. Okay, go back to the presentation. Am I going to find it? So the histogram is something we will lose use quite a lot from from now on. Uh, I've done that a bit. And we'll leave over lead to Andrew now, and um, he will show you histogram in practice with EAA as well. I'm going to go full screen now. Yep. Yeah. No. Yeah. Is it full screen for everyone? No. I can just I can see your whole screen. Let's have a seat. Going back to share. Just a minute. Yep. How's that? Excellent. Yep. Thank you. Um, let me paint a picture <laughs> of where I think uh, EAA sits. Um, not everybody might agree, but it's, it's a perspective. Um, let's take the visual astronomer. Do you want to click one more, Mark? Uh, there he is, um, the old chap himself. Um, the problem, of course, what we all know with the visual astronomy is you're stuck. Uh, if you're trying to see anything that's faint with only being able to get below to a certain magnitude, you've got a, a big issue with light pollution, making that even more difficult. So deep sky objects often appear as a smudge, uh, even with averted vision or whatever else you want to try and use. I like to think of EAA, which is really using video technology, as giving the, uh, the visual guy bionic eyes. Um, it enables him to see, or her to see, um, faint objects. Okay, it uses lots of short exposures with some of the issues that Mark has said, but because it can stack and process on the fly, you can have that sort of visual experience uh, as it occurs. You've also got the opportunity to dump the data uh, for later processing as well. So not only can you see deep sky objects in real time, you can actually take an image of them. So it sits within uh, the, the imagery spectrum as well. The other great thing about it um, is, is you don't need an EQ mount. Uh, I've taken a total of 10 minutes exposures on an alt azimuth mount, um, and they were fine. Um, I didn't think I could get much more than that for reasons which um, I'll talk about. You don't need precise alignment because the software tools actually keep the whole thing aligned for you and stacking. Well, there's a price to pay, and one of those prices is the, is the quality. Clearly, there's a compromise on quality versus ease of use. But real-time images, 
that many people can look at at the same time. So great for outreach. Um, although you're not the most popular person in the field because you've got your laptop blurring out <laughs> nice and bright. Okay, Mark. Next slide, please. Uh, I contrast this with the hardcore imager um, who it, alignment and tracking is crucial, auto guiding frequently required with lots of post -process processing effort needing a skill and practice. And I might argue they use so much computing power, they start with an image in their brain and end up creating it. But that's a, something that I might get some pushback on. But there's no doubt about they get great quality images, uh, even though it takes them all night to get them. Thank you, Mark. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the, um, the Attic camera I use. Uh, it's on the back of uh, the Mead 8 inch I have, which has now uh, threw its hands up in horror and uh, re the software refuses to work, but that's another story. I've also got it on the bottom there with my son looking at, um, um, I think it was the Crab Nebula we were looking at on the back of my uh, uh, ES127 scope. <clears throat> I use uh, um, an image reducer, a focal reducer to take the F10 of the mead down to about 6.3 to give a better, brighter image and reduce the exposure times. Okay, next. I'll just touch on focusing. Um, there are some focusing aids within the software, um, but I almost invariably use a Batonoff mask. For anybody who's not used them, simple, reliable, certainly from my perspective. Um, you pop it on the end of the, of the telescope on the objective. It doesn't matter if you've got a dew, dew field extender, uh, a dew shield extender on the, on the scope, put it on top of that. And you end up, when you look at a bright star uh, with this cross and a line going through it. And the more you get to focus, the more central that line becomes. You want it slap bang in the middle. And whether you're using a DSLR uh, on the back of your telescope or uh, another camera, you can zoom in that bit more just to make sure you've got um, it as, as tight as you can get it. And as somebody said not so long ago, if you can't get the focus right, stick to using your telescope with your eyes. Okay, Mark. Okay, uh, do you want to let me share? Is that me? Share. Okay, hopefully you can see um, the, uh, the attic uh, software. Normally this would be green uh, where it says no camera uh, when you're connected. This isn't a tutorial about the attic camera, it's to give you a feel and a flavour for what it does. Move that down there. Um, this is the progress bar, so if I take a, uh, an exposure it will slowly uh, fill. The on and off to start and stop. I can hit a record button, so all the images it takes before stretching are stored in raw, uh, the raw files on the computer, and you can use those later. And indeed, that's what I, sh I shall be using tonight. It has a finder mode where the uh, sensitivity is effectively turned to maximum at the, at the cost of the quality, because really you're just looking for, your, you've got the image, you've got it central at that stage. There's the video mode that actually you use when you're recording. You can also go to live broadcast. So for outreach, you can push the images that you're creating out on YouTube channel directly. And at any time, I'm as the, as the uh, process is continuing and it's stacking and I'm stretching, I can save an image by hitting this uh, uh, save file. So that's the top. Going down the side, if I switch it to video mode. Um, this is where I change exposures. Um, they don't recommend above about 120 seconds. Although I can go 
uh, up to 600 seconds if I put it in long exposure mode. <clears throat> Binning, I stick to one. This is a colour camera. If I go uh, to any other setting, it'll turn it into a monochrome. You can choose some of the sort of stretch if you want, but I tend to use the histogram manually. I can stack an image or not stack it. And I can use this full width, half mean, to look at the fatness of the stars. S some, um, I think, Opti star, Optic Star uh, suggest you can use these numbers to try and help focus, because the smaller the number, the rounder and the sharper the stars are. But what I can do here is set a reject level. And as I move the reject level uh, up and down, you'll see this red line move up and down. So it will automatically reject frames that fall outside that area. And then I get some stats about how many it's rejected and how many it's uh, not stacked. And there's a variety of other things I can do with the, uh, with the image, which I won't go into. So I'm gonna go to um, playback mode. Um, now, and I say go. And it's a 40 second, the, the image we're looking at were captured in 40 second exposures. Fortunately, we don't have to wait for them all. I can run it on for a few and I'll stop. And we've got an image starting to form. And by moving the stretch, as Mark has suggested, I can turn the black down and bring the white up. And quite a lot of noise as you can see. So let's just move things along a bit, a lot. Stop it there. Ah, because what I didn't do, let me go back. I didn't put stack on. That's easy to reset. Uh, start the image, okay, let's go again. Take it up to about 28, I think there were 29 or 30. Okay, stop. Um, and we can pull this back down and we can play around with the um, stretching. It's, it's not looking as good as did it when they did it before, but anyway, you get the picture. Um, a live image effectively as it's, as it's rolling into the camera of the running man. Now, as a visual astronomer, I think I might be struggling. Um, as it is, uh, you can look at this as it's unfolding. You can go back and recreate this. And indeed, at any time, as I've said, I can ask it to save an image and it'll save it in, uh, I, I, that's down as TIFF there at the moment, but I think you can use, yes, a variety of uh, formats. Okay, so it just gives you an idea of what you might expect. Uh, uh, Andrew, if you notice on your stacking, it only accepted one file and rejected 26. That's tell you what could go wrong with a live demonstration. <laughs> That's because I played around with the uh, rejections, uh, rejection level. Let's uh, turn this off. Um, head back and see if we can just do it one more time. Go to start, okay. Stack the image. No, don't stack the image, go to five. I'll stop this because as you see, we, we've got a handy satellite going across. So now I stack the image. Thank you, Peter. Right, see if we get a better image. Let's pull this down a bit. So it's, it's got more shape and more, more um, dust, etc. there. I can take, as I said, each of these frames and put it through external software, or I can just pop this through uh, one of the images I've taken and put it through Lightroom. And um, 
indeed, we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's go back to you, um, Mark. Stop share. Can you pick that up, Mark? Thank you. not happening yet. Thank you. Okay, next to that. <laughs> I can't see the slides, Matt. Okay, next. Now, obviously, part of the problem, especially with a um, an altazimuth mount, is 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 field rotation. Um, you don't get obviously with the EQ mounts, but altazimuth certainly it can be an issue, um, and it is a bit trial and error, um, and forty seconds. I certainly on an altazimuth uh, mount did not have a problem. I think much more than that, and it certainly begins to show. Can you put the next slide on the map? And you get obviously this sort of effect. And what the software is trying to do is stabilize the image. Um, and you end up with a bit of fringing around the, uh, around the edges. So it's fairly easy to crop to get over that. Okay, next slide. Now, when I first <laughs> took a picture with this, uh, this camera, I had expectations. Um, and um, because you set them fairly high, don't you? Yes, please, Mark. Well, there's the pills of creation. It was one of the first images I took. And at least I'm sat there, uh, I've stood there in the field and I could have looked at that eyepiece all night, but using the uh, laptop and the video camera, I was actually able to see um, the Eagle Nebula and the Pillars of Creation. Next slide, please. And just to show that, that, that some of the slides are, once I put them through uh, Lightroom, um, there's uh, the Orion Nebula, that was 30 uh, 20 second exposures. And that's the running man that you've just seen, again through Lightroom. Uh, and that was 24 uh, of, the, uh, of those images, uh, each at 40 seconds. And these are just the screen grabs. I haven't actually taken the data, the raw data, and put it back through external software myself. So it's not super duper quality, but it's quick. It's uh, very accessible. Uh, it's, it's relatively easy, it's relatively low skill, and very, very available if you want to share with other people. So I think it has enormous um, potential if this is the sort of thing you want to do. Okay, Mark. Now, uh, I've just discussed the, um, the attic, but... Uh, Mark, do you want to talk about some of the others? Yeah, um, as Andrew says, it's very easy to, to do EAA with a number of setups. You just need a, a simple tracking mount um, and a suitable camera, and, and many cameras are available. Here's a, here's a, there's a, a very simple Altaz tracking mount that I've got. Um, three example cameras there that are readily available, ranging from a couple of hundred to... Um, couple of thousand pounds I suppose and even DSLR so any of these will will do so the the equipment outlay is actually pretty low compared to 
full-blown hardcore imaging as as andrew calls it um andrew showed the um, attic proprietary stuff infinity software uh, probably the most commonly used live stacking software is something called sharp cap which some of you may know and it works with most brands and types of cameras as well if you do have a dslr there's something called astro toaster which will do something similar slightly more complex to set up but once it's set up it's it's pretty straightforward to use as well, and that uses um, Deep Sky Stacker, which some of you will be familiar with as well. So I was just going to do a very quick demo of SharpCap just to compare it to what Andrew's got because it's very, very similar. So I'll see if I can share this time. Um, SharpCap. So this is SharpCap going to hide these um we'll choose a camera what could go wrong here we go uh, because we haven't got a camera connected i'm going to choose a test camera so uh, this is something you can all try yourself is download sharp cap and then try one of these test cameras so this uh, gives you an example of using the orion nebula so here's the orion nebula um, it's coming in as it would be in EAA, as Andrew was showing. You can mess around with the exposure length here and the gain. And it gives you a similar sort of effect there. You can play around with the capture area, the file types. And um, let's bring up the histogram. And uh, there's something called live stacking in here as well. Uh, this is in the Shortcut Pro version, but that only costs you £10 to buy. So I think it's pretty, pretty cheap and, and worth playing around with. So um, give it a shot. And as Andrew was doing, you can play around with the histogram, change the white point, the midpoints, the white points, and make it look really horrible. Um, you can take individual um, snapshots, um, export a stack, and play with it in your external software as well. Um, I won't go in, into any more detail on this because it is almost exactly what Andrew was showing there. You set your exposure, you set your gain, uh, you play around with the histogram, you start stacking it, and um, you watch the, the quality improve. Um, so I highly recommend if you want to get into EAA, download SharpCap, play around with the, the demos, and um, that should do you. Let's see if I can get back. And that is pretty much the end of our session today before we go on to what's on next week. Are there any questions that we want to ask just now before we go back on that? Yeah, hi, Mark. Yes. Or, or Andrew. Um, you showed uh, the histogram uh, in black and white. Uh, I've been fiddling around with Registat um, and it was the color. Am I better just to start experimenting in black and white not necessarily no i mean the histogram i was showing there for the m81 was actually color right because it, it was just it wasn't very saturated when when you're playing with the histogram you can quite often uh, stretch the histogram for each individual channel so you can choose yeah. the red channel stretch yeah. that separately and the green and the blue that, yeah. that's often a good way of doing it because the black points for each of the different colors is often at a different position, so you can end up with a, a much cleaner background. So I recommend doing it into three separate colors. Yeah, that's that was where I, I commented that I was going cross-eyed because <laughs> there are so many different computations you can do. Yeah. Uh, you come out with lots of pretty colors, but none of them looked like a, a galaxy. <laughs> What's a galaxy look like? <laughs> I have a question for Andrew. Okay, Nigel. Um, it's just that uh, Andrew mentioned that uh, if he put his binning up to more than one by one uh, with a color camera, it turned it into a black and white image. Could you explain a bit more about that? Well, I think the, uh, I, I'm no technician, but as, as I understand it, you're using the, um, the, the, uh, the, the sort of four pixels to give you the colors. 
So yeah. if you combine any of those, you lose color. Oh, okay. It turns it into black and white. Okay, I'm not convinced that's normally the case. I mean, other cameras I've used, if you bin it, it doesn't get rid of the color. I think it's a specific case for Andrew's camera that, as far as I know, but I don't know. And just one more question for Andrew. Yeah. Uh, in, in his uh, presentation, he showed a, an image of um, the Running Man and an image of the Orion Nebula uh, using different uh, numbers and a uh, length of exposure. Uh, how did you how how did you choose? I mean, what what made you choose those settings for those particular targets? Um, it's trial and error. Um, it's as simple as that. Uh, I've tried. Um, slightly longer exposures sometimes. Um, I, I invariably, I try the shortest exposure I can get away with. Um, and that seems to suit me. Um, when I've tried longer exposures, I've been less satisfied with the results. Okay. Now it may be a function of my camera and my setup. I don't know. But um, 30 seconds is for, for most of what uh, I, I look at is probably okay. Right. Um, but as I said, uh, you can, I can go all the way up to 600 seconds. So <laughs> I, I think I need better tracking than I have um, uh, to achieve that. So uh, um, and whether I get a, a better result at all, I don't, I, I doubt it. Okay. There was a question from Sean earlier on what exactly noise is, Mark. I know you, you went into it in some detail, but uh, Sean, are you happy? Uh, yes, no, I, I had assumed, apologies, I had not um, seen the first episode last week, so like a good box set, I'll go back and watch it. But um, I, I suppose it was really just from the point of view of people who are not used to, when you're introducing people to astro imagery, it almost seems incongruous that you talk about noise in the context of taking images. Now, I know what you're talking about in terms of data, but I guess I was wondering more about a simple explanation of how you would get over that um, that sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the limit of our vocabulary in terms of explaining what people are doing on screen. Does that make sense after half a bottle of wine? Probably not. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, no, noise, as I said, it comes from various different forms, but the, 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 not, the shot noise is, 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 a, is, a, is a whole range of stuff. So it, it's um, light that's not coming from the object itself, that's scattering around from your telescope, from the sky, from a whole number of um, places as well, as well as all the other sorts of noise from the electronics and, and thermal noise. And, and, and it's just random photons striking the sensor or being caused by the sensor really is what we're talking about here. It's just random stuff that is all around us. So if you look through a telescope, you, you, you see the, the thing you're looking at, but there's also lots of other faint scattered light around as well that's um, coming in and getting captured by the sensor. So is in terms of that then, it's, is, is it purely just photons or is it also, as you said, other electromagnetic interference from the equipment around the sensor. Well, yeah, all, all of those. Yeah, the, the, nice. what we call the shot noise is really random photons from all over the place. Um, then there's the electronic noise, the thermal noise that comes from the heat of the chip, heat of the camera, yeah. and the read noise that comes from the electronics and um, noise that's just fixed because of the way the sensor is manufactured and made, and it's not perfect as well. So, quite a wide range of, of of, of reasons, really. That, that was the explanation I was looking for. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions from the assembled crew? Uh, there was, there was, um, I took a, a print of uh, Deep Sky Tracker, some of the uh, frequently asked questions, and uh, some quite good in, information and descriptions of what the, some of the operations do about light frames and dark frames and biases and things. Yeah, so it might be worth other people looking at. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to cover that in in part four, I think, uh, where we're doing deep sky uh, long exposure deep sky imaging. Very good. Well, any anything else, or do we hand back to the, the man in charge? 
Who's that? That's you, yeah. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I hope it was uh, an interesting uh, session. Um, three quarters of an hour seems to be about right. <laughs> um, as, 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 as Mark has said, you can see a, an agenda uh, for part three. Um, and we're looking to do that on the 22nd of April. Um, so... Uh, More live demos that could go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Um, have we published a list yet, Mark, of the up and coming events? The, there are events on the website and some of them are in Facebook as well. We'll keep adding to them as we as we finalise them, yes. In fact, uh, <clears throat> we've got a pretty full um, um, diary till the 13th of May, so uh, well, you can spend quite a bit of your time <laughs> sat in front of a screen, uh, not necessarily looking at Mark and I, but a variety of uh, uh, opportunities so uh, if that's um, if that's it and there's no more questions um, we can turn the YouTube off and uh, call it a day okay. thank you everyone thank you thank, thank you. you yeah thanks very excellent, much excellent excellent yeah. presentation yeah. Thank thanks you. Mark thanks Andrew hey thanks Andrew